unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Sorry, 
Come on, pray. 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 Pray.
few more minutes. Come on. Come on. A few more minutes. Come on. you can but I feel in this atmosphere you can ask for the impossible you can ask for the impossible you can get somebody off oxygen right now you can get a dead body out of a coffin right now. You can change a situation now. I feel it by the Spirit. Come on, change something. I want you to tell God that this I feel is impossible before men. Do it in my life. Come on. Receive it. <laughs> Power of the Ghost. Sickness is living now. Come on, if you're sick, touch anywhere. I feel God is opening ears. I feel God is opening eyes. I feel demons are living now. Any demon around in any man now. You're living now. Whatever it is. Sorcery, witchcraft, whatever it is. The power is come. Come on, give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Come on. Come on. Give the Lord a mighty, 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 mighty. Come on, I want you to give God a clap offering. Clap offering. Tell your neighbor something has happened in my life. I know it. Tell 
your neighbor something has happened in my life and I know it I feel it I feel it let me tell you listen 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 there are times you can pray and you've prayed and you stay hopeful that God is going to do something but there are times you can pray and know that God has done something I know that God has done something in your life today you may be seated come on the Kenyans are in the house Pastor Ram Apostle Solomon is in the house the Oumas the smartest couple Apostle Emma Maweche Pastor Zach the Archbishop <laughs> Ark if it's not yours for us it's our Ark <laughs> Because other bishops will come, so it's the ark. Praise God. The man of God, Pastor Sam Moyinda. Woman of God, Mama Modesta. Kwehanganaz. Pastor Kutesa. Ronald. Of the Remnant Ministries. International. Hallelujah. I don't know whether my monitors are off. There is a way I feel I'm there, but I'm not here. I feel I'm talking in the nose. Something happened. Something happened. Something happened. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Am I going to preach? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. If I start praying for people, I'll not preach. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, give us peace. Peace. Let me tell you, it's in such moments that God changes lives. Such moments, you never know how, but one day you wake up and some things are just dealt with. Thank you. Thank you for praying for us. New Mexico was a success. It was a success. There was healing, there was deliverance, there was answered prayer. What wasn't there? And some I know are watching us live. Somebody wave to them and tell them, we love you, New Mexico. The Lord spoke to me last year about something is going to begin in that land. And so we have an excitement of, um, of what he's going to do there. Be a part of it. If you're not going there, pray for them. But there's something he's going to do. Hallelujah. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. A team has already left for Rwanda. Praise the Lord. How many of you are coming to Rwanda? Put up your hands and I see. Yes, quite a number, even in the overflow. But a team has already left. And uh, they've gone just to make sure they prepare. While you're going to sit, sleep, eat. Everything that was agreed upon. And we're excited. Let me speak like Mama Lois. We're excited to be there. Hallelujah. We're what? Excited. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let me share something in a few minutes. Then we get out of here. We what? We get out of here. I have an echo. I don't know whether you feel it. 
Mr. DJ, I have an echo going through my ears. Thank you, Lord. Some of my monitors, I think, I don't know, are they working? I don't hear myself. Last, the other Thursday, the other, other, I'm hearing an echo, sir. The other Thursday, the other one, I started on something. Oh, thank you for my birthday. I saw the cake. Thank you. For the record, Peter Choir, the song they sang. It was the first time I heard it. I don't remember singing that song in Kawempe. Mama Apostle Emma, do you remember? Praise God. But we thank God for Kawempe. All the anointed men come from that side. Apostle Emma. Praise God. Praise God. Mr. DJ, it's as if I'm in a play. Is it mine or is somebody whose mic is on? Praise God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now listen. We are, we are so humbled to be alive. Eh? I was thinking about it the other day. That... God has given us this grace to be alive in such a time and to reveal the things he's revealing right now. I feel, I feel something wonderful is happening in our lives, in this spirit. And listen, we are going to do things by God on the 12th and 13th that are going to be remembered in this country. Mugamba Amin. We're going to. That's why I ask you, give your energy to those two days. We want the world to know there is a Jesus Christ. And he lives in every one of us. It's not the special man of God. No, it's in every one of us. Hallelujah. That's why I was telling people, Fanero is not a man. It's not an individual. Fanero is the people. Praise the Lord Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. So the other Thursday, I shared something. And I didn't finish it because of time. And I pray that probably now I can do... I'm, there is a third part of it by the time. I know it will not allow me, but if the Lord wills, I will touch on it too. Who remembers the Thursday before? Matthew 6, 22 to 23. You remember that? Let's open there. I want to build something again on that, but in another direction. Thank you, Lord Jesus. One, two, three, let's go. The Bible says, the light of the body is the eye. Somebody say it again. Is the eye. Say it again. Is the eye. Uh huh. If therefore then I be single, uh huh. Full of lights. Praise the Lord. If therefore thine light be single, then I shall be what? Shall be what? Full of light. If your eyes shall be single. Let's read it in the Amplified. One, two, three, let's go. Mm-hmm. Twenty-third verse. But if your eye is what? Mm-hmm. In you, that is your conscience, is what? Mm -hmm. Let's read the message. Read again. Uh huh. If you leave, uh-huh. what a dark life you have. Hallelujah. Now, for some of you who remember very well, I explained the meaning of your eye being single. I meant that that is a place where you see 
by truth. Right? You see, your eyes is full of truth. It fulfills the purpose office. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, it is true. The good, the good fulfilling its office. It is single. It's whole. It is complete. There's nothing that wants to it. Praise the Lord. But the Bible says, but if your eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And he says, if therefore the light that is in thee. Now I mentioned something there and I want to build on it more. Because I, did, I couldn't finish it in time. He said, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is? If the eye that is in you be darkness, how great is the darkness? If the eye that is in you is darkness, is darkness, the light, sorry. And I made a statement, but I want to pick up one. I say, it's possible to have an eye full of light, but yet the light in you is darkness. And, but you, you're saying, oh, but I carry light. I'm illuminated by the Spirit of God. I see. And yet it is full of darkness. It's full of darkness. It's full of darkness. But when, when, when Jesus says, if therefore the light that is in thee, it means there is a definition of the light that is actually darkness. By God, there is a definition of light that is actually darkness by God. And there is a definition of light that is absolutely light. Praise God. Now when you read that scripture, your head, your head tells you, ah, let me see, I think the light, darkness, I think they're talking about the other guy. I, think, I, I can imagine, I think he's talking about the other sister. But many times we don't examine ourselves. And that is why I'm taking time to put this in series and not just preach one sermon. Because it's important. Remember in the verse before that if your eye is full, if your eye is sound, you know, he says, your whole body will be full of light. Your whole body will be full of light. Who remembers in Genesis when the serpent comes to Eve? You remember that time? The serpent came to Eve. And he tempted Eve and Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. The serpent said that God knows that if you eat this what? Fruit. You know it's in the day that you eat thereof. Your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods. He says, he knows that the day you eat this thing, your eyes will be open and you'll be like gods. Are you listening to that? He said, he knows. He knows. God knows. Now, this is what amazed me. Studying the Hebrew language there, the word there was not eyes, plural. The word there was eyes. One eye. You understand what I'm saying? The Hebrew language uses the word eye. If your eye be single. Sorry, sorry. If your eye shall be open. He knows. The devil says, your eye shall be open. Your eye shall be open. I'm going to explain that. Because it's deeper than you think. So, when the Bible says that God knows, this is the serpent, you can now imagine he's tempting man and woman. And he's telling them that God knows, oh, you need peace. <laughs> you need peace. You need peace. It is well. It is well. So, he says, God knows that in the day thereof you eat peace, and your eyes shall be open, and your you shall be like gods. Now, when I say that it's not eyes, it's actually eye. If you go and study, you realize it's actually eye. Um, how many of you have heard of something called the third eye? Put up your hands if you have. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in the secular world, there's a concept that is used and it's called the third eye. And it's literally in many secular religions of the world. It's called different names by different uh, groups. 
Hinduists, Buddhists, uh, some call it the all-seeing eye, uh, some call it the third eye, some, some it's uh, clairvoyancy. Many of the belief systems of this world, Taoism, all of that is simple. They believe in opening the, the eye. All of those religions op- believe in opening the eye. Buddhists open the eye, Hinduists open the eye, Confucianists open the eye. All the other majority of the uh, religions of this world, many of them have that concept somewhere in doctrine. You understand what I'm saying? And if you find somebody whose third eye is open, it is really open. It's really open. It's really open. They can see in the spirit. They can walk in the spirit. They have out-of-body experiences. They have many, many things. If you, if you find somebody who really is, is, has, has, has I had the third eye open, it's amazing the things they can see. One time I saw a video of a certain Indian guy. He trained a little girl to, to start seeing by the third eye. And uh, they could tie a cloth on this little child's eye and they put... A newspaper in front of the child, and what does she do? She reads it. Just like that. She could literally read everything. She could walk on the streets with closed eyes. How old was she? About 11, 12? And so people pay. I saw one time on, on, on the internet, guys were paying about $10,000 just to open the third eye. As in, you go pay, they train you, so you go through many processes. Even the yoga guys do it. You know, meditation. But at the end of the day, their intention is that if the eye is open, that particular eye, of course, psychologists call it the pineal gland. Behind the head, they say that it happens to be a certain gland that, that connects with the human being, but then can connect with a world that is unseen and therefore can help it predict things that are not seen the other side, but, as, but can come to this world. And then they have a psychological <laughs> mind to it. But whatever name it is, even the new age, uh, the other day I was hearing some guys telling, calling themselves that they have been awakened to a higher conscience. You've heard of those guys. They say they are awakened to a higher conscience. Some call, some call it extra sensory perception. But not in scripture. It's not in scripture. There as he is from another world. You understand? And that is why the Christian must know the difference between truth and accuracy. Some people think that whatever is accurate is true. Do you understand what I mean? Do you remember the lady with the divination spirit? you remember that girl? The girl says, this is a servant of the Most High. And they've come to show us the way of salvation. Was she lying? Read it. One, two, let's go. Uh-huh. The same followed Paul and us and Christ saying that's Acts 16 17 these men are the servants of God uh-huh. which do what the way of salvation uh-huh. and this she did many days you can imagine now imagine I was a servant of God seeking to be qualified in the time when they are saying this guy is a cult <laughs> And then this spirit comes along and says, these are the servants of the Most High. Imagine, put yourself in that position. They are saying, you're not a servant of God. Paul is being beaten in different cities. He's being opposed. The high priests say that he's blasphemous. And in that time, a woman comes out, and the Bible says she brought her masters much gain. <laughs> Through what? Sooth say. Meaning that she was never wrong. Never wrong. Never wrong. Do you understand what I'm saying? She brought herself masters, what? Much gain. And every time she would come on the man of God, she would prophesy truth. Accurate. But there was a place in the man of God to say that this is not the spirit by which God ministers. This is, it's speaking truth. But it's not true. Do you understand? At what level then do you qualify that? Because in her, it should have been a light. 
That's why I, call, I told you some of them, they, 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 they call themselves the illuminated ones. They live a higher life of conscience. The eye. It's open. That's why you see some religious, they put red things on their heads. What? It's, it's all an eye issue. Some meditations, you see guys starting here, it's, they're trying to awaken their eye. When you realize they start walking the spirit realm, you realize the gates start to open. The gates start to open. Certain signs start to come in. But I'm not interested in sharing because they're not for you. <laughs> Christ dead and resurrected. But my point is, in that situation, this girl would have passed for a prophet. And we say, eh, this woman, who told her? Because the same Jesus did it one time. <laughs> and they said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So we can say that there was something on this girl, but there was another different spirit at work in the life of this child. Now, many Christians don't even know the difference. They don't even know the difference. Somebody can open themselves to another world without even knowing that they have opened themselves to another world. And they function under something that they call the Holy Spirit told me. I saw it in the Spirit. But at the end of this, you realize is at a particular point, the check in there is, there is an end of madness. If that, if the eye is not true, the doctrine will be wrong. If the eye is not true, even if I'm accurate, I will not be ministering by the spirit of truth. When the Bible says that God knows that if your eye, remember the Hebrew's eye, opens, you will be as God's. Do you realize that the guys of the new age feel they have their own version of God's? Not as according to scripture. And that is why they say everybody thinks that way. Everybody thinks actually they think that we think all of us are that, that way. But you see, they are copying biblical principles and using another source to minister. Are we together? Are we together? Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Now, many of us have read that even Satan... Eh? There's a mic, I don't know where it is, but there's a mic around there. Many of you read that no marvel, Second Corinthians eleven four fourteen. It says, No marvel. Now listen, it says Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, do you realize that what there is not transforms himself into an angel of light? No. He is transformed into an angel of light. They're referring to that world. In that world, he is an angel of light. Do you understand? Somebody can even say, ah, I had an angelic visit. And an angel of the Lord came and told me, see, the devil is not stupid. Do you think he's stupid? He's not stupid. He's not going to come like a guy with funny horns. No. <laughs> and a red face. And a big eye and do- nose. And- no, 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 no. He's not going to come ugly. But now you see, if the Bible says that Satan himself is transformed into the angel of the light, of light, do you realize how much he loves light? He loves light so much that he loves to be transformed into an angel of light. Now, imagine a situation where a brother or a sister begins his story and says, the angel of the Lord appeared unto me this day and told me. You understand? An angel appeared to Cornelius. That would be true. Angels have appeared all through the scriptures. That is all true. You understand? The beginning of Islam was a revelation of an angel appearing to Muhammad. Now, how do you tell the difference that this is the angel of the Lord or this is another angel? Do you think that you're going to have the seven ways, seven signs to look and know that this is the angel of the Lord and the 17 ways to know that he's not the angel of the Lord? No, it's not there. The qualification is of the Spirit. To the spirit. Look at this light. A man looks at Jesus in a certain light. In a certain light. And after looking at Jesus, he says, this guy is the prince of devils. He saw Jesus. And he got a revelation in the spirit. (laughs) And he saw... No, this is serious. A man by a certain eye looked at Jesus. Do you think he was lying? No. He was speaking exactly what he saw. In the spirit. 
I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. He was saying, I saw in the spirit. Do you know how many men of God have been called things and sisters of God? I mean children of God. Brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Whom they have seen in the spirit. Doing certain things. One guy, I don't know whether it was, was it C.H. Spurgeon or D.L. Moody? He said that if there was one gift that the Lord should have left out in the body of Christ was designing of spirits. It doesn't mean he didn't want it. It only means that it has created some of the most confusing things in the body of Christ. The Lord showed me. You look at your lives. Somebody comes and says, God showed me. And you're like, wait. (laughs) And they are convinced that the Lord did what? And you can debate all your life all you want. They'll tell you, me, when God shows me, I know that it is God. Marriages are failing because of that. Relationships are failing because of that. Businesses are failing because of that. The Lord showed me that I go for this business. Why did it fail? Oh, I had a dream, da, 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 da. why did it fail? Okay, if you saw, why did it fail? Let me tell you, the devil can put you on a very, very accurate step-by-step process that can approve to you that God is speaking. There is a way the Bible says that seemeth rightful to every man. But the end of it thereof is what? Deception and destruction. Do you think it's stupid? Look at the temptation in the Gospels. The devil comes to Jesus and tells him, if thou art a son of God, if thou art a son of God, if thou art a son of God, turn these stones into bread. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The devil was in heaven. He knew that this was a son of God. He knew. On the day of baptism, he knew that this was a son of God. He knew. So, you think that he was fighting identity. He wasn't fighting identity. He wasn't fighting identity. He knew who he was. The Bible says, Jesus says, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like a lightning. Jesus was there when Satan was falling. And Satan was cautious that Jesus watched. He was cautious. So, don't think he was not sus. He was just suspecting. Listen, Satan is a spirit. There was no way Jesus could be hid. In him was light. He could not meet the guy and know that this is not a guy from darkness. He knew. You remember the guy who gave a, 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 a testimony from Mauritius. This devil worshiper. The guy has been worshiping the devil since 22. He saw me demonstrating power. The power of God hits him for 30 minutes. He gets up and he says, I knew this was a man of the light. They sense. They know that you're a man of the light. They know it. You don't even need to do anything. No. Look at Jesus walking. He finds demons. Demons look at him and say, what do you want with us, son of God? They know. They know who you are. So I don't think Jesus could be filled with the life of God. And then he comes next to a guy with demons. I mean, Jesus, the devil. And the devil can't know that this is another seed. He knew. But he was dealing with a trick of disqualifying a man yielding to young, lower truth. Not knowing higher truth. That, that was the, the trick there. That is why the first time he says, turn these stones into bread, Jesus quotes the scripture. The Bible says, the thou shalt man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that what? Proceeded out of mouth. The next time, and the devil taking him high on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. Yeah? And the devil, sorry. Uh-uh. The second one. Let's go to the first one. There you are. Uh-huh. By bread alone, by every word. He quoted the scripture. Next verse. And the devil taking him up in a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment, and told him, uh-huh. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. Now, I want you to note that. When the Bible says that is delivered unto me, there is a certain right the devil has on the earth. And that is the qualification of his transformation into the end of the light. He didn't transform himself. No, he is transformed. He has the, light, the right to appear as a transformed entity. It's alright. Yeah? And what does the next verse say? Uh, if thou therefore worship me, O 
shall be thine. All shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, said him. For it is written, Thou shalt not worship the Lord thy God. Thou shalt worship, sorry, the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. And then he quoted scripture. Next verse. For it is written. You see, he, the guy said, Okay, you want to go what? Let's go what? You see, the, the, because I tell people, the Bible says the tempter. He didn't say the devil. He says the tempter. One which comes to disqualify you because either you're not knowledgeable of your nature, particularly. And therefore, because of what you... Your understanding, your revelation. You see, it's one thing to say, I'm a child of God. But it's another when you disqualify yourself by how you respond to circumstances. That's called temptation. That's why the Bible says, and the tempter came. He called him the tempter here. He didn't call him Satan, he didn't call him the devil, he didn't call him Lucifer. He called him the tempter. Why? Because he wants to change your thinking, your feeling, and your judgment. Not your nature. He knows who you are. If Jesus had turned stones into bread that day, he would have fallen under the spell of the devil. Because God tempted he no man with evil. You understand? Now, this is the thing. How many have turned stones into bread to prove they are sons of God and the devil clapped because they did exactly what he wanted them to do because they didn't know a higher truth. I don't know if I'm making sense. Somebody, somebody turns stones into bread. Not, I'm going to, let me do something to prove I'm a man of God. And then the guy does it and then he walks out of the way of the spirit of revelation. And before you know that, you're qualified, sir. But you're disqualified by truth. And the devil says, yeah. <laughs> He's anointed but disqualified. And you can stay anointed and disqualified. That's why the issue is the flesh issue. Paul says, I beat my flesh to subjection. Because the true weakness of the, of the flesh is a lasting. And sometimes a man can last over the anointing. They can last over power. They can last over gifts. And, 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 and you realize that it doesn't have divine purpose in it. It's just, I want this because I also want to prove that I have this. Therefore, let me do this. And then prove to people, even me, I can heal. Even me, I can cast out devils. Even me, I can demonstrate. Even me, I can prophesy. And then you get into their heart and you realize there's a lust. It's a fleshly issue. It's not qualified to divine purpose. No. It is entirely on a man's life of selfishness just to fulfill his lust. And if God has to help you that day, he will refuse to turn stones into bread. That is love. And the child of God then doesn't understand that degree of chastening. Because chastening is not physical. God doesn't chastise our bodies. He's a spirit. He chastises a spirit. And that's why many people can't receive chastisement. Because they don't understand the mature ones of God. He says, for as many as are led. But the mature ones. Not the babes. That maturity in God chastises your spirit. To tell you, woman, you were doing something stupid I could not let you do. The issue here was, the devil wanted you to do this because he knew once you do that, he will quote and say, wait. Isn't it written? So why did you do this? He's crafty. He's not stupid. Some people think the devil is stupid. No, he's not stupid. He's not stupid. He's not stupid. Everything in this world is an illusion. You see what you, he wants you to see. You hear what he wants the world to hear. It's all a... Pro That's why your, program, your televisions are programs. The programmed media. The goddess. Media. That's what you call it. Many of these things that... Many of you, if you look through your world, you realize it's not really what it is. It is what you've been taught and what you have learned, or what you have adopted over the years, or what you have been shown to be it. That's a total self. Many people live a very deceived life in salvation. Very deceived. Very deceived. So it's easy for, 
for Satan to create an atmosphere to make men in the world think a certain way because he knows he has them in captivity, exactly where he wants men to be. Let me tell you, many people in this world, many people in this world are struggling because they've seen with the wrong eye. Many people. Look at the guys of the New Age who say they have an all seeing eye. You cannot lie to them. They will say, I saw you. That is why Jesus one time is dealing with a man. Because he knew that time will come. And then he says, but I saw you under a tree in the morning when I was praying. And the man says, oh, how knowest thou that I was under the tree? And Jesus laughed. <laughs> and he said, you feel that's a mystery. No, no, no. It's, he, it's not that it wasn't good. It was wonderful to see the man under the tree. But Jesus had a bigger picture. He says, because I said unto thee that I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou. He says, thou shall see greater things. He didn't say more things. He said greater things. Let me tell you, there is something greater than seeing a man under a tree. It's wonderful. We all see men under the tree. But there is something greater in God than seeing a man under a tree. This is eternal life. That you might know the one true God and His only Son, Jesus. Am I saying it's wrong? No, it's wonderful to see in the Spirit. It's wonderful. But don't end on the tree. Don't end on the tree. Go deeper. Don't end seeing the person eating food. Go deeper. What is divine purpose? What is divine purpose? Look at how God is dealing with men in the Old Testament. Yes, Jeremiah, what do you see? The guy says, I see a sycamore tree. He saw a tree. Okay, and God tells him, you've seen well. Eh, eh, look at that. He just saw a tree. It appeared, and God said, you've seen well. Then he shows him a pot. What do you see? I see a pot boiling towards the north. Yes, you've seen well. Now the tree represents the children of Israel. The pot represents the judgments that are coming. The da, 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 da. So God starts to connect the tree and the pot. What happens in the end of it? Divine purpose. <laughs> Divine purpose. Whether it's prophecy, pastoring, teaching, evangelizing, whatever it is, apostleship, it all is there for one thing. Perfecting the saints for the work of ministry to the edification of the body. It's good to see you under a tree. But I need to edify you above that tree. What did God call you to do? Why are you called to be a pastor? How far have you gone with your pastoral ministry? How far have you gone with your calling and election? What are the transitions of that calling? How do you understand that place from the call to the elected ones? What are those things, the steps, the patterns that are taught in scripture? How much have you gone into these things? How holy have you given yourself to these things? Men of the world, when they are meditating, they empty their minds. The scriptural teaching of a meditating spirit is opening your spirit for the word. That's called meditation. We don't meditate with empty minds. That's of the world. So it's a meditation. It's the same thing with, um, that's yoga. For us, we meditate on things. The scriptures tell us we meditate on things. That thou give yourself wholly to them. And what happens? What happens? That thy profiting may appear. That means manifestation becomes obvious. When you learn to see it the right way, men start to see a manifestation of your life. They start to see something in your life happening that is godly. Oh, I wish you understand what I'm saying. I wish you understand what I'm saying. I wish you understand what I'm saying. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, begin with a tree. See the man under the tree. After seeing that man under the tree, ask God, why am I seeing him under the tree? Why am I seeing him under the tree? How is what I'm going to see more edifying and perfecting him for the work of ministry? Is it going to make him a better Christian? Is it going to make him stop cheating on his wife? Is it going to help him go back to his life as a minister and revisit his story? If that's it, then you're on the right road. Somebody say amen. Even in your life, whatever it is you see, let me tell you something about his earning. 
Discernment has called us to see things above the sword, not below the sword. Because the word of God is double-edged. You understand what I'm saying? The word of God is double what? Edged. And that's why he says, I pray that you all speak in tongues, but above all that you all what? Prophesy. It's a gift, exhortation, comfort, and who knows the third? Remind me of what's him. Edification. Right? So, do, do you know why it's that? It's because it doesn't mean we cannot dig what's under the sword. Okay? But the mind of the spirit does not want to know how many men shall slept with. The divine instruction of principle is simple. <laughs> Set your eyes on things above. Set your eyes on things above. Yes, you see the prostitute, but God sees the apostle. Can you raise the apostle? Do you know I hate seeing below the sword? Do you know I hate it? Me personally. It is because there is nothing I will see that you already don't know. Fear as if you are. I don't know if I'm making sense. If you are a thief, you are. You are. You are. One time I took a very immature mind one time and I prayed. I said, God, show me something about this. There was a lady I was praying for. And then I saw something and then I mentioned it. Pwah! Then the lady was like, oh my God. God told me, edify. <laughs> Edify, boss. Edify. What's up? Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? Read my word. Where are you going? Where are you going? You understand what I'm saying? Because in there, you might start to have another light. <laughs> in there, you might find another light. Another light. And before you know that, you're judging men not against truth, but against the ability of your human spirit to walk under which source? I don't know. I don't know. Look at Jesus. How many times did he see above the sword? Many times. Many times. Even if he sees under, he wants to end with the above part. He says, okay, I see the devil see you like wheat. But when thou art restored, restore your own brethren. I see it. You see, the point, do you see the end line? The end line is, yes, I've seen, I've seen this, that you're going to be tormented of the devil. That's below the line. But what is above? There's a day you're going to be restored. And when thou art restored, restore thy brethren. That's a word of wisdom. Because it was a future experience. Word of knowledge, past. Do you understand what I'm saying? Perfecting the saints for the work of ministry to the edification of the body. Not just doing business. Because they are lives. I don't know whether I'm making sense. Am I making sense? Am I making sense? Let me define light for you. Let's open the book of Acts. Listen to Paul's narration of the light. <laughs> Listen to Paul's definition of the light. Are we there? Acts chapter 22. He was narrating. He was narrating his story. Huh? Acts what? 22. Verses 6. It says, and it came to pass. This is Paul. Listen. As I made my journey... And was come nigh unto Damascus about noon. Mark, mark the time. What time was it? What time was it? Where is the sun at noon? Huh? 90 degrees, right? Now read. And it says, Suddenly there shone a light. He says, From heaven a great light above me. Now listen. And I fell on the ground and I heard a voice. Saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest, persecutest thou me? Now I want you to listen to this. 
There was a sun up. That day. And Paul says there was a great light. That shone from up. He didn't know the sun. Some of you in the movies, you see the sun. You say light. Because everyone has their own definition of light. But look at this. He said it was noon, like it was during day. And he says, and a great light. Now, when a man calls light out of the sun, and says that the sun was there, but there was a light that shine from above, it was not a normal light. It was not a normal light. And when Jesus appeared, first thing, divine purpose, why does thou persecute me? Why are you persecuting me? And next verse says, listen, and I answered, who art thou, Lord? He knew it was the Lord. And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they, listen, that were with me, so, what? Indeed the light, and they were afraid. But they had not the voice of him that spoke to me. They didn't hear. They just saw the light. But they did not hear the what? The voice of him that what? That spoke to him. Now, when the light came, it came with a word. I don't know if you understand what the light is. It came with, with the word. The word appeared. Christ appeared in the light. Not the man of God, not Apostle Grace. No, Christ. Do you know why? Do you know why I hate, not hate really, I, I, I really explain personal experiences. It is because one time the Lord was speaking to me about it, that sometimes we can misdirect men's eyes when we share our experiences. Sometimes. That's why when Paul comes to experiences, he says, oh, ho, ho, doubtless boast, I can boast. He gave one experience of the man in the third dimension. He didn't give many, but there were many more. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. But there was something God wanted to avoid, because imagine the upper room experience. It was an experience. Upper room was an experience. And in the upper room, the Bible says, it appeared unto them, what? Cloven tongues of? fire. And they all speak as they were aided by the Holy Ghost. And they speak in tongues. That was a wonderful experience. But when those men left the upper room, they didn't come out to speak the experience. What did they do? They speak Christ. Because let me tell you, the total sum of experiences is the total sum of your revelation of the person of Christ. That's why Paul says that you might know in what I've said my revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. Let the total sum of your message show that you have Christ revealed. You understand what I'm saying? Teach, preach, evangelize, heal, prophesy, but do everything in a way that will show that this guy has had experiences with God. There are things no man can think, even if you try. There are things that go beyond gifts. I'm a gifted teacher. I'm a gifted evangelist. I'm a gifted prophet. I'm a gifted uh, pastor. I'm a gifted apostle. There are things that go beyond the gifted worshiper. These are relationship. And they are relationship. Now a man goes out of there, sees things which are not lawful for a man to utter. And then he comes by wisdom to teach those things. And he says, well, how be to them which are mature we impart this wisdom. Now, the end of the mature ones receive an impartation of wisdom, not necessarily with the explained experiences, but with the qualification of the Spirit that indeed this woman has had an encounter with the Most High God. A man comes out of, you, you go into the upper room, experience, come out. What did Peter do? He just preached Christ. He, poof. That's why, you see Paul, he says, when I was a minister, I sought to know nothing. Save Christ and Him crucified. If you're a healing machine, heal up to that point to Christ. If you're a prophet, prophesy up to your end of the word, point to Christ. If you're an apostle, the end of it is Christ. If you're a worshiper, the end of it is Christ. If you're an evangelist, do all the evangelism. The end of it is Christ and Him crucified. He has to be crucified among His men. He's not a diviner. Jesus is not a diviner. 
Jesus is not a witch doctor who just wants to heal the sick. No. Jesus' sister wants to entertain people. He wants to heal you, to be free. You remember what I said? Set my people free, that they may serve me. Every point of freedom points to service. Every point of freedom points to service. Now, I don't understand how you can sit in a ministry for 20 years and still not be a servant and not know that you're bound. It's impossible. The reason why you don't serve is you're still bound in a certain way. And a man, it doesn't matter what happens in his life. If that man is a servant of God, trust me, there is freedom. They are free. They are free. But what do men of this world call freedom? A car. What do men of this world call freedom? A house. What do men of this world call freedom? Marriage. What do you mean? Of... Yet there is a man who says, no, I make my decision not to get married. Why? For the sake of the gospel. Yet to certain men it is freedom. And the place where things become permissible, but they stop to be beneficial. And Paul says, and I shall not be both subject under to any of those things. Yet they are permissible to me. The reason why I'm sharing this is that I'm trying to open certain people's eyes to truth. The way we must see. How many souls are you winning? No. God just show me this. Show me. Show me. Okay, he shows you and you do what? And you win souls? And you win souls? You want to see that you what? Your business increases and you give more? Oh no. You want to see which man God has put for you? That you understand divine purpose of why God connected the two of you to get married? No. She just wants a man. Apostle. A man. Apostle. A man. Then she gets in marriage and then understands the cardinal principle. If you abide in me, husband, and my words abide in you. Because you came out. Stay in. Some people can't understand me. I see many couples who are out of each other. Even the way they act. You see that she's out of him or he's out of her. They are not in consonance with ministry and divine purpose. So what did you get married for? I just wanted, I was tired of being lordly. I was tired of being lordly. Let me tell you, there is nothing you want that God cannot satisfy you with. Nothing. Before you meet the man. Why? Because the Bible says, ye are complete in him. Oh, no. And then he says, his wife, his wife, my wife, you complete me. <laughs> then he tells the husband, you complete me too, darling. No, 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 no. You come in marriage complete. Then you get together and make complete babies, complete ministry, complete money, complete everything. Somebody say, that's me they're talking about. Say, that's me. That is me in the name of Jesus. We redefine marriage then. That every time a couple gets married, ministry increases. But today, when people get married, they stop going to church. They start making babies and then they detach themselves from ministry. From which light? If two are better than one, if one chases a thousand and two chases ten thousand, oh boy, if the man was pastoring twenty members and he met you, he must pastor twenty thousand. Somebody the other day was giving a narration of Michelle Obama. She was with her husband in a restaurant. And then some guy came in and then she told Barack Obama. It's a story somebody told me. She told Obama, can you believe that that guy was trying to hit on me once. And, and then Obama said, eh, it means that if you would have married him, you would have missed to marry the president of America. And Obama tells him, no, no, no. Michelle says, no, 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 no. He would have been president. You understand? She knew. <laughs> he would have been president. <laughs> She feels the thing is on her. <laughs> she shall do her husband good all the days of her life. Her husband shall be called in the courts. Her husband, so I understand. Her husband, her husband shall be. 
her husband shall be honored and called blessed in the courts. Her husband. <laughs> her husband. Come and receive it. In the name of Jesus. He's known. Her husband. He's known. <laughs> he's known. He's known. So he's known because he's her husband. I don't know who I'm helping. He's known. He's known. He's known. Praise God. Anyway, back to the point. Now, the, the, the irony of this is, listen to Paul's testimony. And they that was with me, verse 9, so they saw indeed the light and were afraid. But they had not the voice of him that spake. Huh? Now let's go to Acts 9, verse 3. I want to show you something. Acts 9, verses 3. And as he journeyed, this is somebody narrating. He came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him about a light from heaven. Okay? And, next verse. And he fell on the earth and heard a voice. This is somebody narrating that he had a voice saying unto him, So, so, why persecutest thou? Me. And verse 5 says, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard of thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told unto thee what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with him, listen, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Now listen. Paul says they didn't hear the voice. But they had a voice. <laughs> I don't know if you understand. They had a voice. Do you understand? Meaning, it's probable that when Jesus appeared to Paul, it sounded like... Oh, 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 oh. And they that were with him had a voice. <laughs> but in that life, what do you want with me? Go to Jerusalem. See. That part where men hear, oh. You remember when the Holy Spirit came from heaven? The Bible says in John, they had a thunder. They, they had a thunder. You see, the Spirit, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. There's a voice there. But some guys in the same group just had thunder. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, if you start to enter certain places, certain things start to open your eyes to say, hey, really? Now I understand why Corinthians says they hide maybe many voices in this world, but there's none without signification. God can speak through sun, thunder, sorry, and then you think the guy didn't hear God. Kumbe went thunder, he what? The guy had an instruction. He had an instruction. So, I don't judge men on how they hear. No. I just look at truth. What is that for the perfecting of the saint for the work of ministry? But look at this light. This light, listen. This light, when it came from above, it outshined the sun. You understand what I'm saying? And that was the beginning of the man's running blind. Immediately. Because no physical eye could see that light and stay awake. And what was God's important interest? Kill a certain eye. And open a certain eye. That's the beginning of salvation. Salvation is when one eye is killed. And then your another eye in God is open. And that eye must be of truth. Christ. Dead and resurrected. Let me tell you many. You, you wait. I, I have someone to preach on, on August. Because God has told me we are going to enter experiences upon experiences. But listen. When these experiences come. The end of it is not boasting in them because Paul called it boasting. If it's not divine purpose, if it is not perfecting, that's why when I share an experience, you notice I always attach it to a certain message. Not just to vindicate me as a man of God. No, I already have enough vindication. <laughs> Started to be approved unto God. You understand? Eh? God has already approved me before you approve me. He has already said, Grace Vega preach. You understand? The stamp is already there. 
And that's why I want you who seek to be approved of men. You might stand on the pulpit of Almighty God and find yourself seeking to deliver, to please. That's why many people error. Why do you think was the problem of Balaam? They demanded the prophecy when he couldn't feel it. And he said, what? I have to wire. What did he do? He went to do the gain things of Korah, received something and then brought it on the table. But he was a true prophet of God. But the pressure was too much deliver. And that delivering thing can put you at a certain place. And, and, and that anger, the anger that they are demanding, the people are demanding, that anger that the people are demanding something from you. When that anger springs in, man of God, oh man of God, the first thing you do is go to a place of solitude. Because that anger can cost you the promise. It can affect your whole entire pattern of life and your destiny. Look at the, Moses. They just annoyed him but he said, these people are too much. And then he just gets the rock. Bwah, bwah, bwah. And God tells him, you're not going to see the promised land. Why? He was angry. People demanded. People demanded. So Sam, if he doesn't strike the rock three times, he will yield to another spirit. The way you respond under pressure is key when you're a minister of the Holy Spirit. Me, I don't push it because I have to please you. If it's there, it's there. If I don't feel it, it's not. Period. Look for one who has it. <laughs> you understand? Because God is not stock exchange. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Even God sometimes can appear not to be talking to, to, to you. It doesn't mean that he doesn't want to talk. No. Every time you're pushed at a place where you are required to perform, you're going to walk out of the grace of Christ's sufficiency. If you don't know how to respond to that, the ability is, always look at the spirit that is putting a demand on you. Why does he want it? Does he want it to build the kingdom of God? Or he wants it because he wants to become a better apostle, a better teacher, a better prophet. The things I'll teach during prophetic class in September. But don't worry. All the other classes, there are many. But you see, it's very, very key because once you start to put a, it's, it's a thin line between hearing God and hearing another spirit. Because once that demand sets in Balaam, the next thing you know, he's in the gain sense of core. He says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran after greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain sense of Korah. Balaam was a true prophet. He was a true man of God. He designed in the spirit. But there was a demand on him that did not qualify him to speak in a certain level okay, of maturity to know what he ought to do. What did he do? He instead said, okay, I'll push this gift. And then before you know that, he yielded to another spirit. And they did not know. In the book of Revelation, what you call the Balaam spirit became a doctrine. It's taught on pulpits. And a man says, last night the Lord gave me a message. And he stands on the pulpit. You, you read it. He stands on the pulpit and says, me, God told me that this is this. And then before you know that, yeah, read it. But until you I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine which have not known the depths of Saturn as they speak, I will put upon you. No, 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 no. I'm looking for that part where, uh, how they've heeded to the doctrine of, of, of what? Huh? But I have a few things against thee. Because thou, listen, there, has there them that, bo- that hold the what? The doctrine of Balaam. The false spirit on the prophet came and sat on the teacher and can sit on the evangelist and can sit on the pastor. And what happens? Who taught Balak? To cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now, when the scriptures tell you he taught, wait. But I called this guy and told him, Cast for me, Israel. And the man goes to God and says, And God tells him, I cannot cast whom I have blessed. When Balaam realized that God couldn't, and there was a demand on Balak to reward the guy, what did he do? By now revelation. That's why it's the book of Revelation. Not revelations. But revelation. What Balak did is he went to another spirit. And contacted it. And then after that. Came and told Balak. Even though God cannot curse. Whom he has blessed. I can teach you how. 
to create a stumbling block. Who was that? A prophet. If it sits on a teacher. And what was a stumbling block? Putting a curse on them which God has blessed. And sometimes it happens in your teachings. Every, some of you go to churches where they teach you about generational curses. It's a spirit. And somebody says, me, God showed it to me that if I teach about demons, people will be free. And then they scream and fall. Ah, boy, we are anointed. You come with your spirit and we show you. But the point here is that a, a Christian who is supposed to be free gets into bondage by what they are taught. And they don't even know the difference. How can you tell a man uh, Bishop Isaiah's most favorite scripture. If a man is born again, he is a new creation in Christ. Behold, all things are passed away. And behold, you see it with your eyes of the Spirit. All things become new. And all things are of God. Now, if this man is of God, how then can you tell him now you have a generational curse? Except if you see from another eye. And trust me, they see. Even as we used to see. Let me tell you, if you take me under the, 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 the sword, many of you know, I can see that you are raped, and then your mother, then your father did witchcraft. I see all that. But you realize when I'm talking to you about it, usually I say, okay, I see the witchcraft, but this is it. One time I, I, I was praying for a certain guy, and then I saw some auntie of his doing witchcraft. And I said, I see an auntie, she has hands, what? She's doing things. Oh, yes, that's my auntie, by the way, suspected. The next thing I know, the whole family was broken up. And God told me, that's stupid. That's stupid. Okay, you saw the auntie. But what was the point? Even me, God, I know the auntie. But she also needs salvation. He does not will that any man perish. So if I say that lately, I end on, okay, I see the witchcraft. And I know the person. But can we pray? Because God can shield that person, you, and then get to the witchcraft mama, follows her up also, and deals with her and saves both and takes them to heaven. <laughs> but because my eye is not whole, what do I do? I separate families. Let her die. Die. <laughs> And then you hear people, I went to a prophet, and then they told me who is bewitching me. Okay, now, when you know who is bewitching you, uh huh. <laughs> Let me tell you, there are people, and this is true, there are people God can't allow to know because they are too young to contain it and they cannot move in the spirit of love. Some of us, we know people who do, my goodness, my goodness. Sometimes I'm in my bed and I see people conversing, and God tells me, you can handle this grace, love them. And then you come the next morning and bless the guy who spoke against you. Why? Because you now have the spirit enough to sustain and love. Now, many Christians, I saw her talking about me. I'm not going to talk to her anymore. Ha <laughs> ha! Your eye. That's another light. That's another light. We don't hate them because they spoke about us. We love them more for God. So loved the world and gave his only begotten son. I said a ministry one time spoke. I told people one time so Some guys say things are a ministry. One people don't attend Apostle Grace's meetings. I signed a check for them the next day. I said, God, now, since they are going to do something like evangelism, let me sign. I put coals of fire on them. They are burning them. They don't even know what's on their heads. But they can't sleep. <laughs> now, if I was like some people, the Lord showed me. Those guys, hey, even me, I'm not going to stop to them. And I'm not going to be my friends. <laughs> no, no, no. Listen, if God knows that you're not that mature, he's fair not to show you. Because people can be evil. People can be evil. So it's not enough to know it's true or not. It's not. It's not. What's the point? Where is it going? All things work together. Even the one who talked. <laughs> Even the one who didn't talk. All things. You see, now the sure word of prophecy comes in and tells you, boss, even when they said that about you, it's still working for your good. What do you do? You let go. You move on. You smile. You smile. Then you say, I'm, I'm bigger than this. That's called maturity. That's the right eye. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? That's called the right what? The right eye. Now I want to finish because of time. 
The next thing you know, when Ananias comes to the man of the light, who had the right light, the next thing you know, immediately, his eye is open to be a witness of those things that Christ has shown him and in those things in which he will appear unto them. And that is from that day, experiences are going to happen like that, like that one light. There are many other things in which Christ will appear to them. And don't limit God to the face. Some of you, when you don't see the face, then someone says, I saw Jesus, he appeared unto me on Thursday night. Wow, even me, God appeared to me. He's always there. But when he shows you the tree, you think it's your imagination. He just wants to make sure you can hear. So that he can explain, okay, when you see this tree, this tree represents this. It can represent that and that. And then before you know that, everything is connected together. But some of you, if he doesn't come with the hair, uh, trust me, the experiences of the hair, I have had a few, but I've had some, a couple, about four or five, of the hair, and he comes in form. But the majority of experiences I've had are things in which he has appeared. Are things in which he has appeared. And men, when you follow that line, you'll see Christ every day. And every time that light shines, the word of the Lord comes in your spirit. And the multitude of that word you shall speak. That is why when a man speaks from experiences, you can know he experiences Christ every day. That's why some of you can't preach every day. Because you can't see every day. There are occasions. But Paul used to speak for six hours. Do you know why I'm saying that? It is because the Lord has spoken to me that in the last days, eh, the gift of designing of spirits, it's coming back so heavily on the church. So heavily. So heavily. So heavily. And I can demonstrate it if you want. So heavily. It's coming so heavily on the body of Christ. But it is important whether you're a teacher, pastor, evangelist, whatever you are, that once it comes, you have a certain stability. Your eye. Because many of them begin as Balaam. He says, I cannot curse whom the Lord has blessed. And then you see him in the next verse prophesying of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks of the root of Jesse. Then in a few minutes, He's in another spirit, and they cannot tell the difference. They cannot. Why? Because he spoke about the coming of the Christ, and it was true. There's a very thin line, by the way, in the spirit world between light and darkness. Ask any man who has walked there, really walked, not imagined walking, really walked there. Praise the Lord. So, I pray for you in the name of Jesus. I could speak forever. I pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ. That so I be single. And the Bible says in Corinthians that God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, the Bible says, has shined in our hearts. When he does, what happens? He gives light to the knowledge of the glory of God. He just doesn't give light to men under the tree only. He doesn't end by showing you only who ate the food and who didn't. No. When the light shines in our hearts, He gives the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. By what eye do you see? I pray you see. You'll know who didn't eat. You'll know who is under the tree. You'll see things that will cause men to believe that there is a God. I pray that you'll have supernatural experiences with God and that you'll give men words that are accurate of knowledge, words of knowledge and words of wisdom. You'll know what happened to them when they were five. You'll know what happened to them when they were six. You'll know what happened to them when they were 17. But after that, when the light starts out to shine out of you, it will always focus on the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That you see greater things. What is that woman's call? That you see greater things. What is that man's destiny? That you see greater things. But let me tell you something, saints. There is one word you can say in a man's life, and it aligns his calling. And that calling brings everything. Some words of knowledge and prophecy are bigger than the other. It's one thing for God to sort your family. It's another for God to give you salvation and many things accompany that salvation. I, see, I pray you see greater things. I pray you see greater things. 
greater things. Somebody say, I receive greater things in the name of Jesus. Greater things. I want to know how to perfect the saints for the work of ministry. I want to walk in your perfection, my Lord, in the name of Jesus. If I have yielded to another spirit that is not of you, now I detach myself. God is delivering somebody. God is delivering somebody. God is delivering somebody. Listen, if you've been functioning under another spirit that is not the spirit of God, it doesn't matter how accurate. Tonight, unless you love it so much, let go of it. Greater things await you. Greater things await you. You're raising apostles. You're raising teachers. You're raising evangelists. You're raising pastors. You're raising the earth. You're raising the nation. Somebody say, I receive it. I receive it. Listen to me. Let me be very clear on this. I've mentioned it many times. I'm not against accurate prophecy. I'm not against true prophecy. I'm not against details. I love details. Call the numbers out. Call everything. I love it. But at the end, that light must also give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. It must perfect the saint for the work of ministry. Don't ask for something that is not going to perfect saints. Because you're a minister. You're a minister. You're a minister. Somebody say, I receive in the name of Jesus of the truth of God. My eye is single. It is aligned to divine truth. I see things above the sword in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, Amen. Hallelujah. Listen. Give me one minute. Don't move out. Don't move out. If there is anybody here, it's important for you to be there when the party is going to start. If there is anybody here and you say, I want to be born again, put up your hand. I say, Put up your hand and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Put it up. Put it up. Anybody here wants to become born again? Praise God. Anybody else? Praise God. Anybody else? I, some, I see somebody in, in the overflow. Praise God. Somebody else? Somebody else? Put up and say, today I want Jesus. Today I want Jesus. God bless you. I've seen that hand. I feel there are two more. There's another person. There's another person. There's one up there. God bless you. There's another one around there. Adiwa. Hey, God bless you. <laughs> Praise God. There's another one. God bless you. If you've raised those hands, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. From today, I am born again. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you have made that prayer, come to this brown guy. Let him take your number. We shall follow you up. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. Do we have another Thursday? We have, I think, one more Thursday to the celebrations. Come, listen, come earlier that day. You want to know why? Because I want intercession to begin as early as five. Prayer. We're going to start praying from five, non stop. As people are coming in uninterrupted. For at least for an hour, non stop. Are you going to be here? Keep time. Come with your praying shoes. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God bless you for the Holy Spirit. Amen. I really want to worship you. The message you have just heard 
was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest. Thank you.